but you can see this is a six inch wafer. This particular wafer might be better if I simply hold it up. It has a that blue backing tape on it, and so before you dice it, and you essentially attach it to that uh, dicing tape, and as you dice through, the, the individual chips are still attached. You can see some of them are missing on this example, and then typically while testing you mark them, and you pick up only the ones that are good and put them into a package. And so this should give you a feel for what it looks like <clears throat> after dicing, just before packaging. So you test quick. them while they're in a wafer or after you dice them? There are multiple testing steps, typically. You always test right after finishing the wafer with an on-wafer wafer prober, so you'd make contact to tiny contacts on the, the individual chips, and you do typically a DC measurement, in some cases a full uh, high-speed measurement also. And the reason for that is that you wouldn't want to put it into a package which adds quite, quite a bit of cost if you already know that it's a defective part. Now you can't do all the testing on the wafer, even though the industry tries to do pretty much all the testing as much as possible on the wafer. They normally can't run it at full power because the heat sink is not in place yet. And so there are some restrictions. Uh, and typically with CMOS, the faster you run them, the more the, heat, the uh, power dissipation is going to be. But still, there is a tremendous economic benefit from identifying early whether or not they work or not. So you can simply throw those away. All the wafers that I get typically uh, have no working chips on them, otherwise I wouldn't get the wafer. Except for those, they had four good ones and these are gone, so I didn't get those. <coughs> now from there on, once you've diced it up, and this is just meant as an example, I think I already showed this one. This is a camera chip. Let's see where I can zoom in some more. So the dark square is the the die. As I tilt it, you might be able to, you know, here we get too strong a reflection. There you can see there is some pattern on there. And it would work a whole lot better with a regular microscope to look at it and see the detail. <clears throat> and at some point I can bring in a picture showing also the bond wires attaching it. So this particular package is one that has a whole bunch of pins on the outside and, and those go through. This is a ceramic package. This one is open. For a camera, of course, it has to be open so that the light can hit the chip. Uh, for a typical microprocessor, it's closed off. I brought along another example, not exactly a very recent one. This is a 486. For a while, Intel was naming them first 286, 386, 486. That's the one they had just before the Pentium series came out, which is by today's standards already old also. Uh, keep in mind my memory goes back to the 8088 microprocessor, which came back came out back in the 70s, uh, which was kind of the first big Intel processor that existed. Of course you have AMD making microprocessors also. <clears throat> Motorola was still big in the game at the time. Uh, by now that all has changed and Intel is pretty much the main player except for AMD advanced micro devices. <clears throat> uh, the colors on the wafer um, vary and typically of course there is no intent to deliberately add color. In the case of a color CCD camera you have filters on material that filters out the light on on the wafer because silicon can't really distinguish between red, green and blue. As a matter of fact it's also sensitive in the infrared so typically there is an infrared filter on there that takes out any infrared um, even though there are some exceptions to that. And Typically infrared would show up as purple rather than the infrared that you can't see anyway with the camera. <clears throat> and some of the colors are due to interference effects like on the lower right here that if you have a variable thickness you get a reflection off the top surface and the interface between the insulating layer and the silicon and that gives you a variable color typically you get destructive interference of one color and you see the remaining color this particular wafer has a, a variable thickness across it and that's why you get to, get to see all possible colors nicely next to each other the, the big wafer on top here, the color here is diffraction color, just fine lines that would diffract light and depending on the angle, the color changes, which is a clear indication uh, that this is not 
colored with some sort of stain or pigment, but rather that it is just an artificial color because you only see a fraction of the full spectrum light that illuminates the wafer. <coughs> Now, once you have the individual die, there are plenty of packages around. These are kind of discrete devices. The dual in line package was popular for quite a while, uh, but it only contains so many transistors. Typically, it would be maybe four NAND gates in a single package. We're way beyond that. Even that old processor that I showed you, the 486, I don't know the exact transistor count, but the Pentium, it went up to 5 million transistors at that time. By now, we're looking at easily a billion transistors onto uh, a single die, which is barely larger, uh, typically on the order of a square centimeter. Uh, for power devices, though, you find that it's still a discrete world out there. You just make one device at a time. If you look closer, what it really is, it's still a chip with a lot of fine features, because you can make a better power device if you make smaller structures and you connect them all in parallel, and that's what's typically done. Uh, typically, of course, those would need a larger package in order to do the heat sinking because there is a significant amount of power dissipated within these structures. An example would be this little one would maybe go up to a watt and then you can attach, attach a little heat sink to it that might improve it a little. Uh, these transistors, I think they're typically rated for up to 50 watts of power dissipation. Uh, and then once you get into, this looks like a thyristor, these you bolt on to a bigger heatsink. <clears throat> Typically these have a higher current drive. I don't know what the exact rating is on that one. Uh, the dual inline package, the next generation, were the ceramic packages. And then rather than just increasing in one direction, they start increasing the size in the other direction and have the pins like the microprocessor that I showed you. Um, here is an example. I believe this is a Pentium chip on top of the, the larger wafer is a 300 millimeter wafer, the smaller one 200 millimeter wafer. Again, the color is artificial and depending on how you hold it, the colors will change. But it does make for a pretty rainbow color. And then this particular one has another heat sink, a heat sink attached to it also. Packaging isn't just a matter of connecting the electrical leads. And even there you have to be careful that you have low resistance contact, goes without saying. But typically you have high-speed signals. At a gigahertz rate, we feed data in and out of that chip. And so it needs to be a high-quality, um, a high-speed connection also, which means typically that you alternate signal and ground lines. So you have, always have a ground close by, and you don't get crosstalk to a, the adjacent contact. Uh, really, all transistor, this kind of looks like a germanium transistor right here, uh, with a big head and three long, long leads that you typically clip off once you stick it into a PC board. Uh, that's initially how they started. Inside, um, these days, typically the inside is empty. Um, but typically it's backfilled with nitrogen gas as they seal the package. Uh, for a while they were putting in interesting uh, insulators. Some of it was even a gel-like compound that they put in in order to isolate internally and maybe improve the thermal resistance of the package.